Tonight, we have Deanne Graham, our speaker. Uh, she's an independent scholar of women's health and medicine history. In the late 1990s, she was an early leader of the grassroots effort to decriminalize midwifery in Virginia through community organizing and policy work. Returning to finish her degree in 2005 and 2009, she is, was one of the first recipients of the Virginia Commonwealth University Undergraduate Fellowship Award uh, when she began historicizing Virginia midwifery. She is a recent Virginia Humanities Fellow researching the archives at the uh, Library of Virginia for her forthcoming book, A Parcel of Murdering Bitches, Childbirth and Women's Autonomy from the Original Colony to the Me Too Movement, which is charting the history of birth and midwifery uh, from colonial Virginia to the current debates on childbirth, consent, uh, bodily autonomy, and licensure. Uh, the Virginia experience reflects the larger themes of American women's childbirth experience, state control and surveillance of the female body, and the usurpation of women's authority in the birth chamber by the rise of male-dominated medicine as a profession, and the influence of race and class on everything from the status of midwives to the control of racial categories on birth records under eugenics. Deanne has a BA in Religious Studies with a minor in History from Virginia Commonwealth University and a Master of Arts in Health Advocacy from Sarah Lawrence College. Deanne. Thank you. I still get stage fright, and I didn't expect to be on a stage, but we're Facebook Live, so um, I usually walk, but my daughter is afraid that I would walk off, so I will stay here. Um, and I kind of feel like I was uh, teaching English in China before the pandemic, and it kind of <laughs> has that feel of it being up here. Um, so I will talk some and read more than I like, but it's a lot of information, so I still need my notes. But I'm really thrilled to be here and share my passion for understanding the past and how it affects the present and maybe be a catalyst for change. The title I chose for this talk is The Witching of the Virginia Midwife to reflect on popular narratives I have found not to be true. There are three narratives from within the birth community. One, and the birth community is joined by many historians on this one, is that midwives were singled out as witches during what is often called the burning times of Europe and early colonial America. And as a side, those that were convicted of witchcraft tended to be, get, to be hung, not burned, so there's that. The second narrative that is, is that historically, women and midwives exercised autonomy in body and birth without interference from the church, state, or medical men. The third narrative that I found not to be true is that licensing saves midwifery. Along with that, we will also look at the 20th century to today's medical narrative that birth is dangerous and the medicalization of and attendance of male practitioners saved women and babies from certain death. And how a modern witch hunt resulted from the establishment of the obstetrical profession at a time when allopathic medicine eliminated their competition. At this time, the doctor-patient relationship changed from the patient being in control to, and I quote, a master-slave relationship with the doctor fully in charge and not to be questioned. Witches occupy the public imagination. We love our witches. Uh, we have Samantha. And then, of course, the Wizard of Oz gave us the good witch, the um, bad witch the, of the East and West, Practical Magic, one of my favorites, and Hocus Pocus. Um, or is that Witches of Eastwick? Who? Okay, okay, thank you. And, of course, there's still fascination with the very real Salem witch trials in which 19 people were hung at Proctor's Ledge in 1692. But long before Salem, by 66 years, Virginia was the site of the first witch trial 
in British colonial North America. European witch trials ran from 1400 to the late 18th century with 1560 to 1630 being the most active years. English settlers brought with them a pervasive belief in the supernatural work of the devil. Native Americans were their original objects of demonic claims. John Smith wrote, quote, their chief god they worship is the devil, unquote. And Powhatan, the chief, was, quote, more devil than man, unquote. Reverend Alexander Whitaker, in a letter to a fellow priest in England, wrote that the behavior of the native people, quote, make me think that there be great witches among them and that they are very familiar with the devil, unquote. But it was colonists leveling accusations of being in league with the devil on each other that triggered legal actions. The earliest historical reference to a midwife in Virginia is a witch trial. Joan Wright was the wife of Robert Wright. Robert arrived on the Swan in 1609, and Joan arrived from Hull, England the next year. In the next year, 1610, they married, and by 1625, the Wrights were living in Kickatan Parish, Hampton, uh, with two children, and Goody Wright was the community midwife. Her trial was held in mid-September 1626 in Jamestown. The trial pitted Goodwife Wright against 25 of her fellow Kickatan parishioners, 12 of them women, and likely women she had served during their births. Her court record opens with Lieutenant Giles Allington giving testimony that although Allington had made provisions with Goody Wright to serve his wife. His wife didn't like the idea because Goody Wright was left-handed. Um, so they called on another midwife, a Mrs. Graves. And when Wright found out that another midwife had been called, she went to their house the next day quite angry. Um, and from then on, Anything that went wrong in the Allington household was blamed on Wright. Mrs. Allington developed a postpartum breast infection. Lieutenant Allington also became ill, as did the babe, who died. Soon after that, Goodwife Wright was accused by them of being a witch. And this is um, part of the transcript from her trial. Like many midwives, Wright was known for being outspoken. She once told a young woman who caught her ire that she would make her, quote, dance start naked, unquote. People asked Wright her opinion on whether certain people would die, and she obliged them with her opinion. One man testified that he had left two hens with Wright to go to another woman in the spring. Later, Wright said to someone else that the hens would never be delivered to the recipient because she would soon be dead. Perhaps the woman to receive the hen was sickly, and it was no great jump, although perhaps less than kind, to comment on her imminent demise. Living in a land that was harsh and unforgiving to English ways, everyone, but especially the woman called upon to minister the sick and wipe the brow of the laboring woman, would have seen more and been closer to the realities of life and death. That which may have made her an excellent midwife, keen powers of observation and experience, was turned and used upon her. Grace Sherwood is another Virginia midwife accused of witchcraft. 
and I'm sure y'all know her well. Uh, she found herself in a contentious relationship with her neighbors. Protected while her husband was alive when she was first accused of being a witch in 1697, in a series of lawsuits in 1698 and 99, the Sherwood sued several other community members for defamation and slander based on their accusations of witchcraft against Grace. She was widowed in 1701 and would find herself formally accused of witchcraft in December, soon, sorry. In December 1705, Sherwood sued Luke and Elizabeth Hill for trespassing and assault and battery in her home. Don't know why. They just came to her house and they beat her. And she won and she was awarded 20 shillings. And surprise, surprise, on January 3rd, 1706, Luke Hill had the court summon Sherwood, quote, in suspicion of witchcraft, unquote a laborious process of trials and appeals and retrials ensued, during which it would be ordered three times that Sherwood's body be examined by a jury of matrons. Those were women of the community withstanding and called upon in such matters, and they looked on her body for signs of evil. The first jury of matrons was led by a woman Sherwood had sued. <laughs> A second examination ensued after the general counsel refused to rule on Hill's appeal based on Princess Anne County's inaction on the case. So they weren't moving fast enough for him. So they said, all right, we'll get another group of women to look at her. By July, in languishing in jail, Sherwood agreed to a trial by ducking. And as we know, on a place now called Witch Duck Point in the Lynn Haven, she was rowed out in a boat, bound and thrown in the river. And if she had drowned, she would have been innocent. But she knew how to untie herself and swam to the shore. A third jury of matrons was called to examine her body and despite previous conflicts with community members, the women called to re-examine Sherwood's body refused. They were threatened by the court to be in contempt and would be prosecuted, quote, to the utmost severity of the law. A few jury of women, a new jury of women was ordered, assembled, and again, no women would participate. Grace Sherwood's case was the only one tried at the time and must have consumed the community's attention. Clearly, sympathy for the widow now outweighed the venom of a few people who had had conflicts with Sherwood. Community power is real, and with the women who supported Grace Sherwood. Despite these two cases, midwives were not the main focus of witch trials. Of the 14 witch trials in Virginia, only two, these two, were midwives. The belief midwives were singled out and accused of witchcraft is a powerful myth. It is best known through the 1973 pamphlet written by Barbara Einrich and Deidre English entitled Midwives, Witches, and Nurses. Their publication represents the embracing of the narrative by the feminist movement as a way to reclaim the female body. In 1999, historian David Hardley looked at the evidence and found the historical record does not support this claim. Heinrich and English based their narrative on dodgy sources, repeated over and over until they became accepted as fact which is not unlike how many medical protocols are too often constructed. So if they were not witches persecuted by their communities, who were Virginia midwives? 
The historical English midwife was literate and of a middle to affluent class. The British colonial Virginia midwife appears to have also been. Known for being bold and possessing a sense of surety of self, midwives were also criticized by male medical rivals as women who, quote, will follow their own ways and have their own wills, unquote, and of their, quote, unquote, self-sufficiency. The ecclesiastical midwives' oath of the mother country, England, emphasized them as cunning, skilled, and intelligent women. One medical man claimed he had learned anatomy from a midwife who did dissections. The ritual of the English social birth, the gathering of mature women in the community's selected midwife to support the laboring woman, was the historical organizer of women's relationships with themselves and with each other. The grab of the lower belly and the pressure in the low back signal it was time to call the midwife. The community-based traditional midwife was and is an empiricist, having seen birth from start to finish many times. From these numerous observations, she knew the common patterns and the variations of pregnancy, labor, and birth, probability patterns. With these repeated observations over several generations taught from one woman to the next, general assumptions could be safely made on how things would go, why they were going that way, and what skills would bring about the desired outcome. As part of the community, she knew the laboring woman before her, and her skills were applied within the cultural context of the community and the family. A midwife who was both affluent and very much part of the community is found in the later, later colonial period. Williamsburg's Catherine Katie Blakely was widowed at the age of 41 in 1736. Midwifery was often a widow's occupation. Blakely acquired wealth and property from her husband, houses and lots in Williamsburg, 50 acres of land in Powhatan, among other riches. Blakely never remarried. Oh, what a shock. Why give up her freedom and her wealth? She conducted business in and around Williamsburg and Yorktown, holding accounts in various business establishments, taking in boarders, and catching the babies of white and black, free and enslaved. Blakely's October 1771 death warranted a rare mention of a woman's death in the Virginia Gazette. And this is her grave that is in the graveyard at um, Brunton Parish. Um, and the obituary reads, Mrs. Catherine Blakely of this city in the 76th year of her age, an eminent midwife, and who, in the course of her practice, brought upwards 3,000 children into the world. At the time of her death, Williamsburg's population was 2,000 people. Not long after she died, just a month, a tradesman's ad in the Virginia Gazette reflected a new trend in midwifery that would signal the beginning of midwifery's near demise in America. The new profession of man midwifery and women appealing to male scientific knowledge as superior to their own experiential knowledge of birth. The next Williamsburg woman to act as a midwife for the community would appeal to this new male knowledge as hers by having way of training with them. Mary Rose was believed to be the wife of a William and Mary professor. And she posted this ad in a November 28, 1771 advertisement. The subscriber, having studied and practiced midwifery for some time past with success under the direction and with the approbation of doctors Pasteur and Gall, flatters herself she will meet with encouragement 
as nothing will be spared to complete her in the knowledge of an art so necessary to the good of mankind. Ladies and others are therefore desired to take notice that they will be waited upon on the shortest warning by their humble servant. Most of what's known about African-American midwives is from the antebellum period, such as Clara Robinson, a 66-year-old recently freed woman of color in Richmond. She petitioned the General Assembly in 1848 to allow her to stay in the state of Virginia after emancipation. When the enslaved were emancipated, they had to leave the state unless the General Assembly said they could stay. Robinson argued that she was of an advanced age and bound to the city of Richmond by the strongest of ties. This is hard to read. All of her children being slaves living in the said city and holding association of the kindliest character with many of the families of white citizens here residents. We will see here Robertson is supported, supported her petition by noting that she has been several years professionally employed as an accoucheur or midwife and given satisfaction generally in that capacity and evidence wherefore she tenders the certificate of the Honorable James A. Seddon drawn up in his own hand and signed by a large number of the medical faculty of Richmond who in the course of their obstetrical practice have had occasion to employ her and kindly give this testimony of her valuation. The Virginia midwife of African descent, both enslaved and free, was accomplished if not literate. Free and enslaved midwives were held in esteem by their respective communities and attended the births of whites as well as blacks, no matter their class. So I'm going to show you um, the words of then enslaved midwife Mildred Graves. These are from a WPA narrative. Uh, the white, the, thank you, I just went a blank, during the Depression. And they do it in dialect, so I will let you read it, I will not. Um, but she was the property of the Tensley family at the Totemoy Plantation in Hanover County. And that plantation is still in the family's hands, and I'm hoping to go up there soon. Um, and she was hired out to other plantation owners. Um, and you can read that where she talks about how she was the one that caught the babies in the area. But what she was really the most proud about, and I think this is pretty cool, is that one day she was called out because Judge Leake's wife was having a very difficult labor. And two doctors from Richmond were also called out to come. And in the end, Judge Leake's wife, Mrs. Leake, uh, sent the doctors away and kept Mildred Graves as her midwife. And everything was resolved and she gave birth successfully. These women align with Harley's research, which found that because midwives tended to be held in esteem by their communities, it was actually harder to prosecute them. The role of the middle class midwife shifted in the early Republic period, consigning women to non-industrial domesticity. While Virginia women used midwives longer than Northern women, by mid-century the affluent white midwife disappeared, leaving working class, mountain women, and enslaved and free women of color to tend to birthing women's needs. This brings us to the second narrative 
the strong belief in today's midwifery community that at one time, women had total control of birth and agency over their bodies without interference from church, government, or medical men. The historical records show a different story. One of colonial midwives as instruments of the states in bastardy, adultery, fornication, and witchcraft cases. Access to women at their most vulnerable moments and knowledge of birth, the birth process made them privy to the secret and intimate stories of their clients. That has not changed. Midwives were charged by the authorities to police the morality of the community by uncovering bastard fathers and by determining the gestational age of the child of the recently married. Such rulings could condemn or exonerate a young couple from sin. In a 1664 case, the Northampton ecclesiastical, and there is a document, Authorities put midwife Eleanor Gething in charge of indentured servant Anne Orthwood. This is a book written by University of Richmond law professor John Pagan, where he looks how this case impacted Virginia law because they took English common law, which is what we were under, and one of the reasons we didn't hang our witches like they did up in Massachusetts, who was under the mosaic. Um, but when it, it uh, would fit affluent men, they would fiddle with the common law, and they did so in this case. Um, it was believed that a woman in the height of her labor pain would not, would not lie so midwives were charged to find out who dad was. And um, Orthwood was 24 and had arrived from London the year before seeking a better life. Unmarried, pregnant, and unwilling to reveal the father of her child, she challenged the social fabric of the community that sought to control fornication and identify errant fathers. Sometimes I count how many times I say fornication during a presentation. <laughs> um, just as important, it relieved the community of a financial burden through the father's support of the out-of-wedlock children and payment to the midwife, lest the parish have to do so. During Anne's final month of pregnancy, they sent her to Eleanor Gething's house early to spend that last month there, hoping she would get the name of the father. And if she didn't reveal it, and she did not, then Gething would have another chance during the labor. Um, Anne Orthwood birthed twins. One of them died, and a couple of days later, Anne died. Uh, and it was rumored that Gething had withheld support from Orthwood until she revealed the name of the father, one John Kendall, thus precipitating Orthwood's death. Two other midwives who had attended the birth testified in Gething's defense. Midwives walked a fine line between Satan, sa saint and Satan sometimes. Despite the popular modern belief, women were always subject to male legal power and white colonial midwives stood in the intersection of public and private worlds and struggled with divided allegiances between the birthing woman and the community moral authorities. During my recent residency at the Library of Virginia, I did uncover a short golden age where midwives and women had autonomy. With the Royal of Reconstruction, midwives, both black and white, practice without interference, such as these midwives in advertisements. Um, and here we have a Mrs. Tuck in Richmond. And these are all uh, 
1870s, 80s, and the first um, five or 10 years of the 20th century. It also saw the return of the affluent white midwife, although they tended to say that they were doctresses also. Uh, this is a Pennsylvania um, midwife who um, was the widow of a War of 1812 soldier, and um, they make note that she got that check for being a widow every year for quite a while, um, and she died at 97. And then there is, you might know, Orlena Hawks Puckett. Her cabin is on Blue Ridge Mountain, or um, a reproduction. She never had children. Uh, she had many miscarriages, but in the uh, thousand mothers she served, and this is gonna be a fairly high-risk clientele, she didn't lose one mother. And I love this woman. She looks so elegant. This is Margaret Jones of Lynchburg, also held in high esteem in her community. And here we have some Appalachian midwives. I happen to know the granddaughter, great-granddaughter, and um, niece of these midwives. And uh, they actually lived in Pocahontas County, but birth does not know a boundary or a state line. And so they got their saddlebags, they got on a horse, and they went. This also shows the city directories where you could find midwives and their advertisements. And here, uh, Isabella Voss was born in Madrid. She met her German husband in London. They emigrated to New Jersey and then came down to Richmond. And here is another one with Isabella Voss. Um, and another midwife. Despite what most modern women believe, childbirth has historically been very successful, with 94% of births being vertex and spontaneous, which are fancy words for head down and babe pops out. Another 4% needed some help and 2% needed a lot of help. In the 17th and 18th centuries, death from childbirth was low in context of the other causes of death for childbearing women. In the English New World, because of better food and less crowding, women fared better than in the mother country. And northern colonial women would have fared better than their southern sisters who were exposed to malaria. High mortality that we think of was an artifact of several causes, such as industrialization and the entry of the medicine midwife, a phrase co coined to refer to doctors attending normal birth. Purple fever, also known as childbed fever, was almost unknown before doctors began attending normal childbirth. As doctors began in the 1820s attending normal birth in northern cities, childbed fever rose up in epidemics and women began dying at exorbitant rates, something we would not see stop until the development of sulfa drugs in the 1930s and antibiotics in the late 1940s. It is the safety issue entrepreneurial white men used from the late 19th century to today, using their class, race, and gender to eliminate and now control community midwives and the women they serve. Historically, barber surgeons were the only males invited into the birthing chamber, and only after conditions became dire they brought their instruments of death to try and save the mother. Doctors entered the chamber of normal birth for no other reason than it was easy money and they needed it. 
it was not until the early mid 20th century that most doctors could make a living off of doctoring only. Letters written by doctors in the late 18th century complained making money was difficult is because the people that could afford them were too healthy. Domestic medicine, the tending to by usually the woman of the house or the local midwife also cut into their income. And here we go. Although obstetrics was the first medical specialty, as medicine fragmented into other specialties in the 19th century, obstetrics was viewed as the red-headed stepchild of the messianic message of scientific medicine. Midwives undercut the obstetrical claim of authority Dr. J. Whitridge Williams of Johns Hopkins, an author of the famous Williams Obstetrics textbook, which is still being used and is in its 26th edition, declared in a 1912 speech, the ideal obstetrician is not a man midwife, but a broad scientific man with surgical training who is prepped to cope, prepared to cope with the most serious clinical responsibilities and at the same time is interested in extending our field of knowledge. No longer would we hear physicians say they cannot understand how an intelligent man can take up obstetrics, which they regard as about as serious an occupation as a terrier sitting before a rat hole waiting for the rat to escape. They're talking about us women. His esteemed colleague, famous Chicago obstetrician Joseph B. DeLee, lamented in his 1916 speech, Progress Towards Ideal Obstetrics, that if an illiterate granny or immigrant midwife could help a woman give birth, the obstetrician would not be considered a true man of science. That was the slogan, true man of science. Obstetrics is held in disdain by the profession and the public. It is therefore worthwhile to sacrifice everything, including human life, to accomplish this ideal. With the rise of the market economy and the cult of domesticity and true womanhood in the 19th century, illness and fragility define the mark of a refined woman. The ability to birth without the need of medical assistance was viewed as an attribute of the lower classes, blacks, natives, and savages. Doctors required women to labor and give birth in bed, thus complicating the process by rendering the woman passive, laboring against gravity, and exacerbating pain. Alice B. Stockton, MD, wrote in 1885 that in no other country did women have such pain and trouble in childbirth as American women. Heroic man midwifery, later called obstetrics, offered first laudanum, then by mid-19th century ether, and finally, twilight sleep in the early 20th century. And this is a slide of a woman with twilight sleep. When they first gave them twilight sleep, which is scopolamine, which is, uh, you might know it for nausea, but when too much is given, it's a date rape drug and they would flail in their beds. And then after they gave birth, their husbands would wanna know why is their face black and blue? So they started wrapping them with lamb's wool and tying them down to the beds where they would sometimes stay for days in their own um, feces and urine. Uh, but it's an amnesiac, so they didn't remember. And scopolamine, uh, twilight sleep, um, slowed down in the 50s, you started getting caudals, but some doctors used them until the 70s. I had a friend that was a psychiatrist and he said he had um, several patients 
that had PTSD from their twilight sleep, and it was real hard to work with them because the, it's like they knew something had happened, but it was, it was, they couldn't remember, but they just knew that they had been harmed. Um, Virginia, like the other southern state, sought to control but not eradicate the rural midwife as there were not enough doctors in those areas to serve working class white and black women. Progressive era movements of medical professionalization, public health initiatives, and eugenics walked hand in hand to better society through science and thus subverted Virginia midwifery. Perhaps the most notorious, and we're back in Tidewater, public official in this regard was Virginia's own Walter Plecker, MD, with the instituting of vital statistics married with the control of both midwives and the populace. Midwife education and training was severed from its community-based apprenticeships, moved to the centralized local departments of health and standardized according to the authorized Virginia Department of Health's midwife manual. The wise midwife of slavery times in Reconstruction was given a starched white hat and a rubber apron. In his fanatical desire to reconcile women, uh, people with a drop of black blood to the status of quote unquote colored, including Virginia's Indian population, Plecker threatened midwives with prosecution for quote unquote falsifying the race of the parents on the birth record. You were either white or you were black. There were no Virginia Indians, according to Plecker. As in the colonial era, the state used midwives to exert legal control over their subjects, this time in the favor of eugenics-inspired racism. Plecker wrote threatening letters to midwives for, race, for registering babies as white or Indian instead of black. One Chickahominy midwife quit rather than participate in Plecker's paper genocide of her people. Plecker wrote an article that appeared in the 1914 Virginia Medical Monthly provocatively entitled The Midwife Problem, calling for the midwife's eventual elimination, but due to Virginia's large black population, he deemed them a quote-unquote necessary evil for the time being. He blamed the state's infant and maternal mortality rate solely on midwives. Noted Virginia medical historian and Plecker contemporary, Wyndham Blanton, MD, pointed out that Plecker himself had determined from pre-1860 records that the mortality rate was higher, quote, among the mid white midwives attended by doctors than the Negroes attended by midwives, unquote. Blanton added that, quote, in this country where 80% of pregnant women delivered by men, the mortality rate is six per thousand. In Sweden, where 80% are attended by midwives, it is only 2.3. Per thousand, as often happens when medical authority and power were paired, inconvenient statistics fell before ideological purity. Childbirth moved to the hospital in full force after World War II, and with Medicaid in 1965, rural black women had access to doctors and hospitals previously denied to them. And this brings us to the third narrative, that licensing has saved midwifery. In the late 1960s, oh, wait a minute, let me show you these. So this was on the same paper, page, uh, in the newspaper, talking about how midwives were hurting 
women and they needed doctors. And then on the, oops, on the other side was an article that said infant mortality drops as family income rises. <laughs> um, so in the late 1960s, counterculture hippies and back-to-earth women, along with some feminists, began to return to home birth. In 1976, nurse midwives, once attendants in the mission field and the U.S. poor, now serving affluent women in hospitals, lobbied the Virginia General Assembly for recognition. I do want to say, though, that there was one nurse midwife up in Shenandoah that uh, was a fabulous midwife, and she did home births. Um, so there were still some nurse midwives that could operate in the, could serve in the field. Um, the subsequent law that came from the nurse midwives lobbying in 1976 eliminated the Virginia community midwife. The handful of home birth midwives still practicing were grandmothered in. Ironically, within 10 years, Virginia joined the home birth revival occurring across the nation. This new movement was predominantly white and birthed out of the Christian family and feminist movements. At first, midwives practiced in the open and were often welcomed by rural Virginia health departments. In the 1990s, as more educated and affluent women, such as the wife of a Tidewater assistant commonwealth attorney, the wife of an anesthesiologist who placed epidurals at a Fredericksburg hospital all day, and a professor of women's studies at William and Mary started choosing home births. Obstetricians became alarmed and through the Department of Health Professions Board of Medicine began harassing midwives, resulting in midwives going underground. Tired of their community midwives being harassed, a group of Virginia citizens lobbied for the decriminalization of home-based midwives. The original group was predominantly the clients of a traditional midwife from Hanover and Williamsburg. She moved, same midwife. Led by the husband of another traditional midwife from Floyd County. As a crunchy affluent group and midwives with a CPM credential not yet recognized in Virginia arrived and seeking societal acceptance, they eventually outnumbered the original group and the initial vision of bodily autonomy for women and the sovereign authority of families became a licensing bill which passed in 2005. Licensing stopped arrests and fear of prison, but it has not stopped the harassment of midwives. While Virginia law gives home birth midwives a wide berth on who they can work with, if there is a transport, uh, the midwives are too often turned into the Board of Medicine by someone at the hospital. And the women, for having served women wanting normal birth after a previous cesarean section, for carrying a breech baby, twins, and for traveling to a place where they could find a practitioner that would honor their wishes and their autonomy. So we have many places in America where Women have to drive four and five hours to have a hospital birth, but if a midwife ac accepts a client who drove four and five hours because no one would honor their choices, if there's a transport, that midwife's gonna get in trouble for having accepted someone that lived that far away. Um, with three different credentials and different educational paths. Today, it is not easy to define what is a midwife and sometimes a contentious question to even ask and answer. 
The historical midwife was a woman who the community women chose to attend their births and who learned her craft from her mother or an older woman in the community. Today, the state decides who is a midwife and lines seem to fall between those who practice relationship-based traditional midwifery and those who practice the medical model. We are seeing the attrition of the traditional midwife as licensing has herded midwifery students to schools which front load their education with the fear-based obstetrical model of a mechanistic body, thus separating women from their mind, soul, spirit, and community and turning women's life experiences into numbers to be collected like OB residents counting Q with surgeries. Finally, returning to David Harley, his research revealed when midwives were accused of witchcraft, it was usually by other midwives. Another aspect of the modern witch hunts of the 21st century is midwives who see themselves as medical professionals working with the state to eliminate the midwives who practice traditional midwifery based on autonomy and consent. I ask you, what does the future hold? What is, where does this lead us? Will women ever have autonomy in childbirth? Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. That's a lot to digest. My mind is whirring. Uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, are there any questions? And if you have a question, I'll bring the microphone to you because we have to record it because we have to have the microphone so we can go to can remain on Facebook Live. So. so did you find that the illnesses um, associated with the physicians attending childbirth were um, related to them performing autopsies and then Oh yeah, that giving, was that was part of yeah, it. Yeah, so they would perform yes. an autopsy and then go to deliver. Yes, a and at one point they said, we're gentlemen, we can't spread disease. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, how, how many years has it been since Semmelweis and Lister? Over 160 are all, and there's still problems with getting doctors to wash their hands, even during COVID. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, assisted? It, it tends to stay at 2%. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. But for a, like 40 years it stayed at two, so yeah. So it's not that many, so what's the fuss, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, and I, you know, regardless of what you think about Roe v. Wade, it never gave women bodily autonomy. It gave doctors the right to perform a procedure without being arrested. All right, coming your way. What's the, what's the, uh, what is the current certification or qualifications for a midwife in Virginia? There are three different certification qualifications. One is um, certified professional midwives, uh, which is a direct entry program. Um, in Virginia, you can go to, um, what's MEEK stand for? Midwifery Education Accreditation Council. You, yes, which is more formalized. <laughs> or you can do what's called the PEP process, which means? Portfolio Evaluation Process. Yes, uh, which is more community-based and, um, yeah, a lot of good stuff there. Uh, to be a nurse midwife, you need to become a nurse and then practice and then um, get a master's in nurse midwifery. They have now recognized as of a year or two ago the certified midwife, which is the same education as a nurse midwife, but you don't have to go be a nurse for a while before you can start your midwifery education. 
All right, anyone else? Not, not really. Um, I mean, I was watching Iron Jaw Angels yesterday, and it was filmed in Richmond. And I don't know if I didn't see it before, because it's an old movie. But I'm like, oh, there, 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 there. But I'm looking at it, and I'm like, so we've had the right to vote for how long? And we still don't have bodily autonomy. Other women are going to make different choices than me. I just want to be able to make my choices without being harassed. And um, there's a lot of people that um, are pro-choice for abortion, but not childbirth. A lot of women obstetricians are like, yeah, you can do that, but no. You can't stay home with the midwife of your choice because then you become dangerous. And what was interesting, I'm, oh, the tit main title of my book, A Parcel of Murdering Bitches, comes from a 1714 court case in Lancaster County where an all-female household was referred to as being. Um, and a midwife testified in a trial, so that's how it came on my radar and it went, that's a title. Um, so, um, when are we? When, when, are we going to have choices of our own bodies without interference? Especially when it's is ancient. I mean, the oldest profession is helping a woman have a baby before we start other professions. Um, so I, I, I've been a board certified OBGYN for 28 years, and I think there is hope for the future that um, nowadays 82% of OBGYN residents are female. So, you know, when, and I had been in academics for 24 years, and when I trained, it was mostly men, and the, the male doctor, the dogma, all that, I recognized that. I think things are changing for the better, and I hope I have helped change uh, medical education for the better. Um, but, you know, so that, that is a good sign, is that there are m many more women that are doctors and many more women that are OBGYNs. I would, you would think, but it's gotten worse on midwives and women making choices, um, and some of the worst have been Females. Um, the um, going with a female OBGYN, you're most likely to get a heavily medicalized childbirth and cesarean. And I'm sorry, right now the researcher that f found that out has slipped my mind, <laughs> but um, because that's what she would want. Um, so I think you would have to parse the female OBGYNs with those that, um, what their philosophy of birth is, but you're more likely to get cut and, and have a medicalized birth. And of course, that all starts with unnecessary inductions, which 50% will end up in a cesarean section. All right, we're going to take this one more question. So on the heels of that comment, how much of a role does insurance, uh, the insurance industry play into this whole conversation? Because midwives chose to become part of the system a lot. And also, we don't know how to think about our own um, medical and health care, which I differentiate on what those are, because health care is what we do. Um, Although I would also say it's, you know, government policy uh, also decides what health care because um, maternity leave would be a hell of a health care policy uh, and medical care. Um, but there's been many women that would want, want to have a home birth, but their husband won't let them 
because insurance won't pay for it. Um, back in the illegal days, my midwife just would quietly bill Blue Cross Blue Shield and a check would quietly arrive. It just all depended on who processed your papers. But um, yeah, it, I mean, it's cheaper and you're, for a midwife, you're gonna have fewer sections, you're gonna have fewer complications. But remember, insurance companies have doctors making these decisions and they will make those decisions out of their um, relationships with their medical trade unions and their, the, peop the other doctors that they know. So yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. It ought to be embraced. We have the worst maternal mortality rate in the industrialized countries and, and um, infant. And it is because we do so many sections. But time is money. I wonder if uh, in Hampton, in Hampton Roads, we have hospitals close by. Uh, those of you who have been out in the country, I grew up in the country. My hometown still 400 people. Rural hospitals are gone. Yes. Um, I wonder if that in some way figures into the trend maybe. I can recount because my mother and I, my mother's 87, have recently had this conversation. Her mother was born in the home. My mother was born in the community hospital, a five room hospital that she can point out to me as we drive by in a town of 400 people, which was a town of 400 people in 1934. <laughs> uh, I was born in the county hospital, which is gone. Now to give birth, you have to be transported to the nearest conglomerate hospital, which is 50 miles away. Uh, if you're lucky. <laughs> so yeah. that was not a question, just an observation. I wonder if, if by necessity rural people may have to move, move back into this practice. Well, somebody has to help them. Midwives need to make a living. Um, and you, what, a home birth is somewhere around in Virginia around 5,000? Uh, if insurance doesn't cover that, you see why people end up with a 10, 15, 20, what it, depending on where you want, where you are, thousand uh, dollar obstetrical bill that the insurance covers after they've negotiated a cheaper price, and it's will women ever have autonomy? In childbirth. All right, deep subject. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out tonight. Remember the things I mentioned when we started? Come back next Wednesday night for a party and then come back on April 22nd for a different kind of party. <laughs>